Hello everyone, today we are doing an overview of the Native Arts of the Americas before 1300. 1300 because um, before 1300 there were no European invasions into the Americas that we know of. To begin, let's review how people first arrived in America. It's a common misconception that they must have come by boat. Uh, that, that is actually untrue, or rather there is no historical evidence to support that. Archaeologists instead suggest that the first people came to America by walking over a land bridge uh, that had formed sometime between 30,000 to 10,000 BCE. The world was much colder then, and this area connecting Siberia to Alaska was frozen over, so people were able to walk. If we look at the native people from eastern Siberia, we see a lot of physical and cultural similarities to the Native Americans. And I've got images of Native Americans from, from the Northern Americas and even from um, South America. But if we look at their folklore and their culture, we see a lot of similarities that suggest they might be connected to the native Russians of eastern Siberia. What was life like in the ancient Americas? This is another one of those those things that's kind of hard to generalize, but in general we can say that ancient Americans were very skilled architects, especially in Mesoamerica we see monumental sculptures and structures made of stone. And many of the civilizations that existed were obviously very advanced. They had advanced writing and mathematical systems. Uh, and a very, very advanced knowledge of astronomy. Native Americans had access to fertile land. In many cases, gold was available, and there were other abundant natural resources. And we have evidence of extremely rich and stable and complex societies, maybe even more stable than the societies that we were looking at in Europe. However, ancient Americans did not have use of the wheel for transportation. Wheels were used, but only as toys. Horses and cattle are not native to the Americas. This is a very common misconception. Horses were actually brought over by Europeans. Before Europeans' invasions of the Americas, there were no horses. And most ancient American societies only used stone tools. They didn't use metal tools or metal weapons. Not until the Europeans arrived. The European so-called colonization of the New World would be better defined as a mass genocide. It's actually the most massive genocide that's known in history. Um, and it began uh, formally in the 1500s when European explorers, mostly Spaniards, arrived in Mexico. And unfortunately, the civilizations that we are going to look at today were essentially completely wiped out as a result of this colonization. You'll often hear America or the Americas referred to as the New World. This is just the name that European explorers gave to the Americas when they arrived, and they would refer to Europe as the Old World. So we're going to begin in Mesoamerica. Meso means middle in Greek, so this is sort of the middle Americas. And the uh, cultures of Mesoamerica can roughly be broken into the pre-classical, classical, and post-classical period. The pre-classical cultures, the two major ones that we're going to look at are the, the Olmec culture, which is sort of the, the founding culture of Mesoamerica. Then we're going to follow that with the Teotihuacanos. The classic period, um, the most famous culture of the classical period is the Maya. Um, and then the post-classical, we have the Maya, but then also the Toltecs and the Aztecs. And you can see, if doing any research in these cultures, that they all strongly build upon one each other. So of the Olmecs, probably the most famous monuments that they created were the colossal heads. And these colossal heads are quite mysterious. The Olmecs did write, but we don't have many examples of their writing, and some of it is still undeciphered. So nobody really knows what these heads were made for. 
They're huge. They weigh tons and they were dispersed throughout the Olmec Empire. So it's believed that they were carved and then rolled to important places in their empire and placed along roads because there's evidence of a complex sort of highway system connecting various important cities of the Olmec Empire. Perhaps these heads were the heads of rulers. There are um, lots of these heads and each one of them seems to have very distinctive features so that they are believed to be portraits of actual people. But again, their true meaning remains unknown. The Olmec hieroglyphics are the earliest known writing from the Americas and we can see examples of them on um, various tools that were used by the Olmec including this here a jade perforator and a perforator is just any tool that's used for creating holes it's believed that this perforator and ones like it were used in ritual sacrifice since there's evidence that the Olmecs believed that um, ritual, ritually inflicting pain upon themselves and specifically drawing blood was pleasing to the gods. And many of the artifacts that they left behind are made of jade since the Olmec people believed that jade was not only sacred but that it and all green stones were actually alive. The Teotihuacanos are another important culture from this pre-classical period and they're just called the Teotihuacanos because that was the name that was given to this their most massive city. Teotihuacan is actually a word in the ancient Aztec language which is called Nahuatl and Teotihuacan means city of the dead because when the Aztec people found Teotihuacan it had been uh, long abandoned and the Aztec people were fascinated by it and called the people the mythical semi-mythical people who lived there Teotihuacanos. This is an aerial view of Teotihuacan um, and it, you can visit it today and uh, what's left are the large temple structures there are surrounding them um, the remains of a sort of like vast apartment complexes where people would have lived and there are these avenues these streets you can imagine when it was first built this was a, a bustling very well organized city and at its center were these temples these people that lived here were very religious uh, around 600 CE which was its height, Teotihuacan was, his home, was home to as many as 200,000 people and these temples uh, during that time period would have been brightly painted. In order to paint these stone temples they would have had to have been uh, coated with lye and lye is created from burning tree bark that was, that was the way that they were able to extract lye. It's believed that because they constantly were reapplying lye and therefore cutting down trees and burning them, the Teotihuacanos might have created a miniature sort of um, environmental crisis that forced all of them to leave because at some point everybody in Teo Teotihuacan just abandoned the city. Because we don't have any access to their writing, we're not sure exactly why they would have abandoned some archaeologists suggest that it could have been a political revolt as well, but essentially it's just very mysterious. We see on the temples evidence of worship to a feathered serpent god, who in this case is called Quetzalcoatl, and will later be adopted by other cultures and most famously called um, uh, Kukulkan by the Maya. This is a mural painting from one of the apartment com complexes at Teotihuacan. So you can see the brightly colored decoration that's painted over the, the plaster that's made with lime. All of the buildings would have looked like this. And in these, these paintings in the apartment buildings, we can see images of the gods. And many of the gods, like this one here, you can see extended extending from this god's hands are images of... Um, human parts because these people strongly believed in human sacrifice and human sacrifice uh, 
was typical of a lot of worship of Mesoamerican cultures. In order to please the gods, people were killed annually and in many cases buried below temples. Now, I, I've heard some people argue that this this legacy of human sacrifice is um, beastly and inhuman and the Europeans certainly used it as a tool against Native Americans calling them uh, completely inhumane for practicing human sacrifice. However, I'd like to argue that the European colonization of the Americas, the mass genocide that they undertook, and also uh, the burning of witches and the, the wars that were taking place in Europe were no more or less humane than um, the history of human sacrifice of the Mesoamericas. Let's talk a little bit about the Maya people. Uh, first, let's review the use of the word Maya versus Mayan. Uh, you'll be tempted, as I am right now, to call the Maya people Mayans. However, Mayan with an N refers only to the language. So the Maya people and, in plural, the Maya are referred to only as that. Don't add an N to the end of it because that's technically incorrect. It's only uh, say that if you're referring to the language. In any case, we're looking at some examples of their artifacts from 300 to 900 CE. And the Maya Empire extended uh, throughout Mexico and into Guatemala and Belize and some parts of Honduras and El Salvador, so uh, very widespread in Mesoamerica. And although the Maya were never politically unified, they, they lived in separate kingdoms and were connected by um, their, their language and their sophisticated knowledge of astronomy and their culture and religion. So this is Mayan with an N, refers to their language, which is read by archaeologists and is still spoken by some people today. Their hieroglyphics are very beautiful. They look like this, and their writing was organized in this kind of a square shape. The ancient Maya ball game is something some of you may have heard of before and was central to their culture. It was played by swinging a giant rubber ball around on your hips. And the ball was very heavy, so the players wore um, this heavy sort of padding. You weren't allowed to touch the ball with your hands or feet. There were two teams, and the goal was to get the ball to through a hoop on the wall. And typically, the team that won would all be sacrificed to the sun god, because it was considered a great honor to be sacrificed to the sun god. And this here is a small Jaina figure. Uh, and th these ceramics here that depict scenes from daily life are called Jaina ceramics. This is a Maya temple, which I'm including so that you can see in this rendering what it would have looked like when this city was still inhabited. All of these temples that we see would have been covered with plaster and lime and brightly painted. This is the one that I want you to pay special attention to since it's an excellent example of Maya architecture. This is the Castillo in Chichen Itza, Mexico, which you can still visit today. Uh, this is part of what would have at its height been an incredibly um, sophisticated and large city. If you look at this rendering here, you'll see that the temple, which was sacred to Kukul Khan, uh, has snakes that run down its side and when the sun sets it makes it appear as though the snake is crawling because of the way that the shadows of the stairs fall on it. This here is the snake uh, god Kukul Khan often referred to as a feathered serpent and the idea is that snakes were associated with life, uh, with death and rebirth because of the way that they shed their skin and they crawl on the ground and are, in the case of the feathered serpent god, is co he's covered with uh, flowers to suggest fertility and rebirth. Let's look at just one example of native art from South America. Some of you may have heard of these.
these are the Nazca lines in Nazca, Peru. I'm including these images so that you get a sense of scale. When you're on the ground, you can't really see the shapes that they form at all. In order to really appreciate them, you have to see them from a plane. Here's an aerial image of the hummingbird from Nazca, Peru. And these are very mysterious, like a lot of Native American art, because the people who made this didn't leave behind any written records. We're not really sure how they made it or why. If we go back to these images, you can see, looking at this, that the images are, are drawn into the, the plane by removing the first layer of soil. The native people that live in this area uh, will often walk the lines and in that way they're maintained. But why exactly they do this? Uh, everybody has a different reason for it. It's seen as, for some, a sort of meditation. Maybe at some point in history it was connected to some kind of ritual. Almost all of the images are of animals. And then let's look at some art from um, what we now call the United States of America. I want to talk about the Serpent Mound of Ohio. But first, uh, what is a mound? Well, mound is just a word for small hill. And the woodlands native people of the Americas typically would create these mounds. And in them, when archaeologists have uh, dug through them, they've found arrowheads and small objects in very rare cases they're also used as burial mounds so people were actually buried within them I, um, I actually took this picture I used to live in Ohio and there was a nearby city called the Plains and I you could just drive around and find these mounds and some people I met had actually dug into them and found some objects within them but I I would never do that. Not only is it terribly disrespectful and I think probably really bad luck, but it disrupts the work of archaeologists um, because if they were to come by later they would never be able to find the objects. This here is an aerial view of the Serpent Mound and this is in Ohio. If you are just walking the grounds you can imagine that it doesn't look like much, it just looks like a hill. In order to appreciate it, you have to view it from above. How did people that weren't able to get up into a plane um, decide to create this kind of artwork and then uh, come up with a layout for it and then maintain it? It's not really known. There are a lot of mysterious aspects to this kind of work. One thing I find interesting about this is that we see here another image for, of a serpent and you could even argue that this is a feathered serpent since uh, it's, it's on the ground and it literally has things growing out of it. I think that examples like this really do uh, support the theory that uh, all of the native people of the Americas have common ancestry since we see so many similarities between the artwork that are created between vastly different cultures. And then I finally want to show you an example of cliff dwelling. And the, the cliff dwelling we're going to look at is very old. It's made by a people that are now referred to as the Ancestral Puebloans because their name, their, their former name, the Anasazi, is actually a Navajo term which means enemy ancestors and is seen as derogatory as some, by some because it was a name that was applied to the ancestral Puebloans at some time in a, a more recent past because the Navajo considered them to be enemies. Some of you may have visited this site and there are quite a few that are similar to it that are still in existence in the southwest. This is the Cliff Palace <coughs> at Mesa Verde in Colorado. And Cliff Palaces like this one uh, were essentially fortified cities where people would have lived. They're very well contained and they're built in such a way uh, that they protect the people within it not only from the elements but from p potential enemies. Cities like this were very well planned and show evidence of uh, 
an incredibly integrated way of living with nature and living within a community. And if you have never visited one of these in person, I highly recommend you do so, because when I went to visit this national park, I was absolutely blown away. Even having seen pictures of it, the experience of actually walking through it and imagining what life would have been like is indescribable. And that concludes this lecture.